Forrest gave the keynote at Transformative Impact Summit, and uh, there was so much, and we because we had so many speakers presenting, uh, we only had maybe 20 minutes for Forrest, and um, he did an incredible job of sharing uh, what we're going to go through today. Um, and it was so dense that I felt like uh, we would all benefit not only from hearing it again, but but Forrest and I, actually, we'll, we'll get into it uh, as we get into our presentation, but just some context for today. So the first hour, we're going to be speaking with Forrest uh, in this new format we're introducing. And then at three o'clock Eastern, so in about an hour, we'll be going into an impact speed dating session where we'll, where we'll get into breakout rooms and get to connect with others on the call uh, for about 45 minutes. And then we're going to be running a 45 minute Society OS crowdsourcing civilization designs workshop for the first time. So appreciate everyone being here. Uh, we're going to our presentation that we're going to be sharing kind of gives a little more context. So I'll, I'll save anything else for then uh, for when we're sharing it. But Forrest, anything you want to share before we jump in? No, I'm looking forward to as this goes. Thank you for inviting me and glad to be here. Awesome. Okay. Well, we will get right into it. So again, this is an event we ran last uh, December. And the focus of today is grounding systems change, a metaphysical perspective. This is the talk Forrest gave at the event. And uh, we're going to get into a little bit of the context. So again, there were nearly 100 change makers speaking with dozens of solutions, technologies, and impact works <laughs> presented. And uh, again, Forrest is a philosopher, master craftsman, and author of Intermittent Metaphysics, among many other works. And you can uh, look into his work and, and pick up some of his books, many for free online at mflb.com. Um, and really the, the question, you know, we had all these incredible folks with revolutionary green technologies and doing uh, powerful on the ground change making. So the question is why, from their perspective, why does metaphysics matter? Why philosophy? And really the, you know, this, this comes some of my language, but, uh, and so Forrest as we'll speak to, you know, feel free to uh, correct as you see, but if we're gonna climb high on the ladder, we wanna make sure it's leaning against the right wall. And so many of us are concerned about the state of the future we want to make sure that any energy we're putting into making a difference in the world is going in the right direction. And so the format of today, you know, Forrest and I about a year ago uh, were discussing how folks can learn about his work, learn more about his work. And we were talking about the idea of how do we onboard people to this wealth of um, knowledge that he's or, or insight that he's produced and we, we were playing with a few ideas. And one was this idea of almost a, a teacher training program where sometimes, and we were talking about it in the context of almost like a martial arts dojo, where sometimes learning from the master can be uh, not the best way to start because they're so deep in the weeds that they don't necessarily uh, have the context or, or have forgotten the context of the beginner. And so sometimes it's better to learn from the apprentice so we talked about this idea of um, having uh, a student, so to speak, or someone who's learning Forrest's work, present it to someone uh, in Forrest's presence. And so um, this is my attempt to understand and communicate what Forrest was sharing with Forrest here to adjust, correct, and add on as we go. So we're experimenting with this new format. And... Uh, to jump right in, metaphysics asks three main questions. What is, how do we know, and what do we value? Otherwise known as ontology, epistemology, and axiology. When we ask what is, we're asking what is in the sense of what exists in the world or the universe rather. And what is, is nature. And nature's process is evolution and the force that comes out of that is change. How do we know? There are many ways that we know. We know through our inner work, our inner exploration. 
our exploration in the world outside and our uh, engagement with others in the world. And for the purposes of today, how we apply what we know as a, as a society, as a global society, has tended to manifest itself through technology. And that the force uh, of that impact or the, the force of uh, how we apply what we know is causation, our ability to cause change in the world. And in terms of what we value, life, love, and play. Oops. And that manifests as ethics, uh, the, the kind of principles behind our behaviors, um, and those are represented by our choices or those, those um, actualized by our choices. And so we have these three forces in the world that are really in response to these three questions of metaphysics. What is, how do we know, and what do we value? Those are change, causation, and choice. And I'll pause now uh, just to um, invite Forrest to at any point correct anything that I'm saying or, or uh, modify anything that we're um, that, that maybe not be properly representing what he intended. And I'll also invite everyone uh, in the in the room to, if you have questions, uh, we're gonna save uh, sharing them till the end, but feel free to put them in the chat so you don't lose them. And so I'll just keep going unless Forrest, uh, you have anything to, to add as we go. Um, well, I just, I, first of all, the presentation is great and the um, dynamic. So just to reemphasize for folks, I'm mostly just going to jump in if I see something that might be helpful to explain or to expand or to describe. Um, Elliot has basically um, volunteered to convey this material. And so in effect, I'm, I'm, there's a kind of balancing of wanting to have room to allow the presentation to take the form that he's explaining it, because it'll be easier for people to relate to. Uh, but also to try to make sure that things are, are technically correct. Um, one of the things that has been identified in a lot of this is that thinking about choice, change, and causation are very low level, very primary basic things in, in the way the world works. And so by understanding the interrelationships between them, we can, we can work better in the world, in ourselves, and in our relationships. And so therefore, we're putting emphasis on that. Thank you. Uh, yep, go ahead. So these three forces, change, change is change that we kind of receive, change that comes to us from the outside. Causation is another form of change, but it's change we assert. It's change that we cause in the world. And choice, our the determinations we make about our actions and non-actions in the world. Now, these three forces in a historical context, historically, we were kind of um, at the mercy of change. And the, you know, through, we were, we were effectively having to adjust to and adapt to nature. And so success in the world historically has always been uh, a result of being able to work in flow, work in flow and uh, or adapt to nature. Causation introduces, you know, with the, the industrial revolution, although you could argue the advent of any tool that uh, gives us the ability to assert our will upon the world, um, rather than simply adapting to the change that we have no control over, we've causation facilitates us applying and imposing our will on the world and manifests through our ability to influence and, and even craft our environment. And then choice is based on our ability to discern, our ability to make sense of the world and um, so understand what is happening, understanding what choices are possible and determine the right choices to make uh, with respect to our values and desired outcomes. So today, we, as we're all too aware, we're facing existential risk 
in the form of pollution, inequality, global warming, species loss, et cetera, species loss, et cetera. And this has all been caused effectively by causation, by our imposing our will in the world, mostly manifesting through technology, but that being just one of the forms of causation. And at this point, we're beginning to see that technology can't be the solution to all problems. And this is one of my favorite lines that Forrest shared at the event. Technology tells you what you can do. It doesn't tell you what you should do. And the question we have in front of us today is, what should we do? Forrest at this point brought in the Fermi paradox. The Fermi paradox basically asks, where are all the aliens? With the mind-boggling abundance of uh, stars and planets throughout the universe, you, we would expect that at some point we would find some other, we would stumble upon or, or be greeted by other uh, intelligent life. And yet we haven't, outside of you know some recently shot down balloons maybe, uh, but that, that points to that either life is extraordinarily rare or technologically based civilizations don't persist. And if it's true that technologically based civilizations don't persist, then we have to become skillful so that either we do persist as a technolo technologically based civilization, or we learn a better way of being that isn't based on technology. Now, to understand choice, we have to understand that we transcended change through causation. It allowed us to move beyond the limits of being uh, affected or uh, victims, not the right word exactly, but victims of change. We're very adept today with causation, but we, as we've discussed, causation cannot solve today's problems. If we are going to be skillful and survive as a species, we must transcend causation. Modern philosophical movements speak to consent and inequality and colonialism. And these are effectively a critique, not of nature and the universe, but of the choices we have made uh, the, to affect change in the world. They're a, a critique of causation as we've applied it. We must increase our skillfulness in making choices individually and collectively. I'm going to jump in one specific Please. sentence here. So Thank you. the thing about the, the, the postmodern philosophy is that it is a critique of modernism. And modernism as a philosophy is essentially highlighting the notion that um, our technology, our science is a way of overcoming nature. So in effect, it's a it's a kind of rejection of nature, a rejection of of essentially the subjugation that uh, humanity had experienced since you know the last million years or so and so in effect the idea is that um, we're talking about philosophical concepts as being cultural uh, directions or ways in which communities of people large-scale communities of people um, think about the world and think about how they make choices in the world so in effect we're noticing that modernism in the sense that it's it's, it's focused upon the idea of progress using causation to remove ourselves from nature, that postmodernism is basically saying, well, we've constructed all of this stuff and it isn't working very well. I mean, some things are working great, but other things are going really badly. And so in effect, the, the, the postmodern critique is essentially to, to kind of make the transition from causation-based thinking and value structures to choice-based thinking and value structures. And I'm going to stop with that because I think you're you're good at this point. Thank you. And so um, all that to be summed with that our our skillfulness in making choices, uh, both as individuals and as a collective, uh, matters significantly, and hence why philosophy matters. You know, again, the context of the keynote was this change maker event where people are, you know, with all their hearts in absolutely the right place applying causation trying to go make a difference in the world um, but this grounding this is why we feel 
uh, this grounding is is so vital and why Forrest was the invited to be the, the primary keynote. Um, so in terms of choice making, how do we determine the right thing to do? Well, we have to be more conscious in our choice making, again, individually and collectively. We must look at the designs of systems like governance and community. We must distinguish between community process and institutional processes. There's this idea uh, that institutions are the only way we make choices, and we've been we become so enamored with causation that we've effectively replaced community process with commercial ones. And for me, this brings in this idea that like in modern society, you know, we've really become consumers. We've um, we've almost abdicated citizenship, and as a result, community we are no longer engaged in community writ large. And we must thus relearn how to do community and make choices as a community again. And not just the folks that, you know, these change makers at the event or people in this room, but as communities of people in the world as a whole. And this, you know, the, there's a reason this is emboldened. There are multiple ways for us to have community processes be wise enough to make the kinds of choices that we are that are needed for our species now. I think this is not insignificant, and I, I hope uh, after we we finish the presentation, we get into a Q and A that we we get into EGP because one of the things when Force and I first started speaking, in part one of the one of the themes or one of the inquiries I had was. Uh, some for those that are not familiar with global unity it's a systems change effort that includes elements of civilization design we've been thinking about for a very long time and Forrest introduced uh this notion that the very way and we're talking broadly about that individual and collective choice making must is very important and we must be more more and more wise at these processes and Force introduced the idea that the very process of engaging in collective choice making, collective governance, must itself increase the wisdom of the individuals partaking. And this for me was uh, a very impactful idea to say the least. So as we get into values, ethics, and choice, we want to understand the relationship between them. Values are what we care about. Ethics are the principles of behavior which we follow to embody those values. And choice, the choice we make, determine our behaviors and whether or not they embody those ethics. Now, for us at this point, um, and if anyone is has notices they're they're unmuted, if you could mute yourself until uh, we get into our discussion, that'd be great. At this point, Forrest brought in the idea of legacy that we are all people with limited lives. What do we leave behind? And this, this for me was not insignificant uh, in that. So many of us are familiar with uh, the indigenous wheel of life or Maslow's hierarchy that I, I believe kind of stemmed from that. Um, and so Maslow's first hierarchy at the top had self-actualization. And then later he had a second edition that uh, had eight levels instead of five. And at the top was self-transcendence, beyond self trans, beyond self-actualization, beyond kind of becoming what you're meant to be. Self-transcendence is giving back to others, giving back to your community and your world. But even that is insufficient. There's another model, uh, the five classes of pleasure, that uh, shows a level beyond that, which is legacy. It's self-transcendence in perpetuity. What are you going to do to make the world a better place, not just in your lifetime, but beyond your lifetime. And I thought it was so astute to bring this in because it really seemed to me, and, and please Forrest uh, correct or, or comment, but it seemed to me to just so simply uh, hone in the question of values because we all, you know, we all have the need for food, water, and shelter. And as we look higher up Maslow's hierarchy, though, we all have all of those needs, but an, an, a commonly missed one or, or seldom discussed in many circles, at least, is that of legacy. And 
for me, it when we think of legacy first, it, it kind of simplifies all of the questions of values because it goes back to really what is this world we want to leave behind? What are the choices that we can make that will provide for our future, for our children, for next generations? So Choice, I, please. So I've got two things that I'd like to mention. One is, is that it's helpful to distinguish between ethics and morality. And this is because if we des we're describing ethics as the principles of behavior, whereas morality would be a system of rules that would help us to uh, govern behavior in a sense of a particular culture. Um, the reason why it matters is because if we, uh, you, you notice that we haven't mentioned any specific values. We want to be agnostic about that to some extent because the ideas of good choice making with wisdom and holism are to some extent in embodying of culture, but they're not necessarily about a specific culture. So in effect, we're talking about principles that would be applicable in any civilization, in any technological world. And so when we're thinking about low level concepts like choice and change and causation, uh, we're, we're explicitly not making cultural references because we don't want what we're talking about to be uh, just applicable in, say, you know, Western United States or, um, you know, some very specific uh, embodiment of a particular tradition or religion or something like that. So it's, it's important to kind of mention that uh, part of the reason why we're characterizing these things and what might seem to be uh, abstract principles is so that we can effectively apply it more generally because we are talking about um, trying to basically do um, how we think about life, liberty, and, and happiness on a global scale, uh, not just at an individual scale or at a particular community scale. Uh, the other part too, this is, this is the whole other thing. Uh, when we're mentioning legacy, there's a, a principle of effectiveness, which is to begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like there's a book called uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the declared uh, habits to cultivate is to begin with the end in mind. And so in this sense, when we're thinking about legacy, we're in effect beginning, we're thinking about what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis is if we're thinking about what's going to be left from this, it goes, as you said, self-transcendence, it goes into the world, it becomes part of the better world we want to have our children live in. Um, and so in this sense, there's a, there's a kind of organizing principle or holism principle that's coming in from the sort of global perspective back down to the local perspective or from the you know, far away in time to very local in time. And so in that sense, the idea of principle, again, is sort of reinforced because it would be something that's applicable at all of these scales. Um, in, in terms of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I usually refer to this as the motion from self-actualization to world actualization. Uh, it's essentially a transition to a kind of effective altruism, although I'm not thinking about this in a sort of utilitarian perspective, but more in a perspective of what is an organic whole choice that's inclusive, um, not just of my needs and the immediate community around me, but the world at large, not just for this moment or this year, but for the, the next thousand years, for example. Um, so in that sense, they begin with the end in mind, sort of kind of helps us to lean forward into these larger scales. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to add those things in. Um, so now we're going back to choices are effective to the degree um, to pick mm -hmm. up there. Well, I'd love uh, to comment on that quickly because I actually, you, you talked about kind of being culture agnostic and not uh, articulating any values in particular, but I, I almost feel like legacy by its nature does that, but it does it in a, ver in a universal way that is not cultural, culturally specific because it it gets us to think about something that we all must care about, which is, you know, the few, the, the perpetuation of our people, if we're not going to say species. Um, I thought that was that that's part of why we had highlighted it there. And um, something you'd said about Maslow stuck out, but we'll come back to it if uh, we have time after the Q&A. Well, the, the, the idea is, is that we are actually sort of beginning with the notion of culture in a, in a fairly basic way. Like, for instance, when we think about 
um, the relationship between um, vision, strategy, and culture. I usually want to start with culture first. Hmm. Um, a lot of people, when they're thinking about institutional design or business uh, forms or academic forms or things like that, um, they're, they're usually starting from a kind of vision or strategy perspective. And that can become very, um, very grounded just in one person and not really holistic in the sense that we're talking about. So in effect, on one sense, we're saying, yes, we are valuing holism. We are valuing the idea of good choices. Uh, we want to have choices which are elegant or beautiful or affirming of health or things that uh, embody all of those at once. But the idea of a good choice is, is a notion that, that, that is a, a kind of value. But in effect, we're trying to facilitate culture rather than in effect have our thing um, be just about one particular culture. So in this sense, there's kind of this, um, this sort of just gentle uh, tension between uh, principles which can be applied within culture to facilitate culture. So uh, in the same way that we think about in the United States, you know, governance um, of the people, um, by the people, or for the people. And in this sense, we're talking about, um, you know, culture uh, that is that is enabled by, a, 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 you know, a set of, of cultural practices and a cultural principle that, that effectively allows us to have the overall dynamic be of culture, by culture, for culture, in a, in a sort of, you know, kind of um, general way. Um, and, and again, that's a little tricky to speak to, so I'm not, I'm not critiquing here. I'm just trying to add that, that there are nuances around that that, that that people will be deeply interested in as, as, as these things go. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. And, you know, we were, when we were discussing today, um, you pointed out that, like, some of these points could be their own dissertations. And so, yeah, we, we could certainly go uh, very deep with, with much. I remember the thing that stuck out about Maslow. So he, I believe developed his hierarchy after spending time with Blackfoot uh, indigenous folk. And they actually have their own model that goes beyond the, the self-actualization piece with community actualization, um, which I found fast, I found uh, overlapped beautifully with, or was exactly what you were saying of world actualization. Um, and I, I had not been aware of that until relatively recently. Um, so given that choices uh, must serve our capacity to perpetuate the species, we'll say, they are effective to the degree that they enhance life, create community, develop nurturing and develop nurturing relationships, which are furthering of our future. Now, History, recent past, and now, the deep past is defined by change, by us being affected by the, the sways of the world. The recent past, since, well, you know, we could argue since the invention of the first tool, but since the Industrial Revolution is defined more by causation, our ability to uh, cause change. And our moment today and the future is defined by the choices we make. We are both individually and collectively the product of the choices we have made and the choices we could have made. If we are going to evolve as a species, it will be because we have developed a skillfulness in making choices, again, individually, as communities, and as a world, because we need to. We, as we spoke to, we are facing existential risk today, and um, we we no longer causation and technology are no long, no longer suffice, and so we must become extraordinarily skillful with making wise choices. Can I interrupt briefly, just one second here, please? So there is a technical thing about the product of all choices we have made, and all the choices we could make. It's could make from this point on, not what choices we could have made in the past in the sense of the mm. counterfactual. And the difference mm. matters because in the sense we are um, in this moment with our technology, with all of the things that we have learned about how the world works, we are really, really enabled 
to do a lot of things for the future. So in effect, it's it's like we have been shaped by all of the things that have uh, brought us to this point, all the changes we've made to this point, but they've given us tools and facilities and capabilities of thinking about the future in a very broad way. And so in that sense, our um, our notion of ourselves as a humanity, as a species at this moment, is in a tremendously empowered one. And so in effect, it's to notice what got us here might not get us there, but in, in a sense, it gives us the capacities to that's, that's rethink about how we're going and, and get different. Um, sorry, if your mic's open. Um, Alex is on this thing. Anyways, um, so the, the, the notion would be that we would have um, re-articulated how we experience the future from a future's point of view and then bring that back into the present rather than thinking about how we are informed just by our past. Hmm. Thank you. And that, and that kind of, that sparks some interesting ideas for when we get into civilization design later. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our success, so to speak, in persisting as a species will be because we've developed a mastery in the process of making quality choices as much as uh, having gotten here has been because we've developed a mastery of causation or in prior epochs, a mastery of living and flow. By being effective in the sense of loving, producing community, and producing holistic health, by thinking of things in a holistic way, we can support the value of life itself. And I, I just want to comment that I, I, as I was prepping this, what a, what a world we'd have if we thought of effectiveness. It was just such a joy to listen to Forrest say, you know, effectiveness in the sense of loving, producing community and producing holistic health. What, what values to be striving for? What definition of success or effectiveness to be uh, instilling? Now, in terms of the scales of change, through making effective choices, we set the ground to get in right relationship with both nature and technology. And the scales of the three great creative forces, those being uh, choice, change, and causation, evolution happens slowly and incrementally. It's microscopic. Technology happens quickly and has a massive impact. It's macroscopic. And our choices are in that in-between, the mesoscopic. And at this point, Forrest uh, was speaking about them in terms of scale, but something struck me that not just about scale, but about speed, that evolution happens very slowly, technology moves very quickly. And with the state of things today, things are moving so quickly um, that they're, they're somewhat alarming. And it reminds me of this quote from uh, another philosopher, Bayo Kamalefe, who says, the times are urgent. We must slow down. And it seemed like there was something important in this idea that our choices can be the bridge between very fast change and very slow change, which we'll, we'll get to in terms of our choices and the relationships to both nature and technology. So if we want to become skillful in our choicefulness in concert with both evolution and technology, then we have to consider the relationship between the two. And with respect to the choices uh, available in those respective spaces. Now, between technology and nature, currently we view or at least behave as though technology is a uh, dominating force. We also operate with this naivete that nature uh, is, this might be the the modernism view, but that nature is a, a source of resources, which we, as we extract them, we then transform into technology, uh, which then allows us to extract more from nature. And that, uh, you know, in a limited world is, is uh, a recipe for disaster as, as we're seeing. 
we think the nature is in service to humanity. And, and on this, I wanted to comment that I would even argue because we've become so enamored, as you pointed out, with our tools and our technologies, not only, I would even argue that we see nature in service of humanity, but even that has become humanity in service of technology. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, the, the main thing that uh, I, I, I find that at this point, it's actually quite helpful to present a diagram. And I was just actually just about to try drawing it. Um, think of it as sort of a triangle. So in other words, uh, a triangle with the point to the left. And I would label the the bottom node on the bottom right uh, as nature, the node that is to the left uh, and kind of in the middle as humanity, and the node that's on the top and to the right as technology. And currently, we kind of have an arrow of um, nature pointing to humanity in the sense that, you know, we, we think that um, nature is is beneath us and that to, to some extent we're extracting resources from it and then we 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 basically believe so in other words there's another arrow that goes from technology to humanity we we believe that technology is entirely for our own service right that that we use the computers and when we're done we just throw them away but the computers are ostensibly for the humans for the people that are using them but Ironically enough, most of the technology that we're using is actually in service to corporate interests. It's actually in service to technology itself. Technology is not actually serving humanity. It's mostly serving its own interests. And when I say its own interests, I'm including business and institution and the theory of the firm and, and, and the kind of social organizations that we currently have, which are uh, hierarchical processes of transactional dynamics of one sort or another. Um, that these uh, th that these functional perspectives of hierarchy and transactionalism, what we think of as modern commerce, is itself actually technology. And so in this sense, technology is functionally actually serving itself. It's not actually providing for the needs of humanity and certainly not trying to provide for the needs of nature. Like if I look, um, there's an arrow that goes from nature up to technology. And this is the sort of extraction uh, mining and um, deforestation and so on that's going on so that's the current perspective that's the sort of naive perspective what we actually want is essentially a um, in the same sort of way that humans are facilitating technology we want technology to facilitate nature so when we think about love is that which enables choice like this is a very deep underlying notion we're not just thinking about it in a sense of one person loving another person by enabling their dreams to come true or by enabling them to become more themselves or more enabled in life to become healthy. We're also thinking about this as a cultural phenomenon that to some extent, um, you know, cultures can actually facilitate other cultures to be healthy. Or we can think about uh, humanity at an even larger scale as facilitating the well-being of ecology. But for us to do that as individuals is, you know, I, I have the power of one human being. I have basically uh, 200 watts of mechanical energy that I can bring to bear and, um, you know, roughly some amount of intellectual power that I can bring to bear. And so that pattern transforming capacity to move atoms around or to, you know, shift energies and things is, 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 is bound by my own uh, physical body. But if I think about technology as being something that I facilitate and that the technologies that I create are designed to facilitate the health and well-being of nature, then in the sense that the world becomes more alive and more healthy, then nature can be in right support of humanity in the sense of providing clean food and clean water and things like that. So in this sense, we genuinely want to um, recognize that technology, although it is currently essentially a kind of toxic phenomenon in the world at large, that understood in the right way of facilitate, facilitating human choices through causation that we can actually be in support of change. We can be supportive of change in, in, in nature to move it into a direction of healthy ecosystems rather than just healthy economies. Um, and, and this is, of course, you know, fundamentally important. 
Um, so this is this is kind of how I would, you know, you probably do two triangles, the triangle as it is today, um, and, and sort of the naive perspective, and then the triangle as it will need to be tomorrow, that forms a, a sort of cycle or close flow of what is supporting what, that humanity supports technology to support nature, to support humanity, to support technology, and so on. And that that flow has a has a naturalness to it that um, we're currently not availing ourselves of. And this is part of the reason why things are breaking down because we're um, interrupting or breaking the natural flow of the world in effect um, to, to, to think about the, you know, when we're thinking about aeonic time or, or, or the really long periods of time, the epochs we're talking like since the birth of, of humanity itself, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago to, um, you know, roughly maybe the, the invention of the plow uh, 6,000 BC or something like that. Um, and then at some point, you know, we're looking at um, kind of recognizing that in the same way that um, causation has transcended just living in the world of change, that we now need to transcend causation with effective choices so that we can enable positive changes, healthy changes. So in effect, we are um, thinking about choices as a way to move from a causal orientation back to a change orientation. So, so choice is the thing that mediates, uh, in the sense you were talking about in between, like it's the middle scales. It mediates between the, the fastness and the slowness. Because right? you can't go from fast to slow directly. You have to go through the middle in order to get there. And we are, in effect, the middle. So this is... Um, kind of connecting the dots and some of the things that you've been mentioning, which I which I think is very good. Um, the other piece that 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 I thought uh, would I would want to emphasize a little bit would be, um, you know, the more important the choice is. Like for instance, you're you're mentioning that quote, which I loved by the way. I haven't heard that one before. Um, that that you know things are moving really fast, so therefore we need to slow down. Is basically saying. The more important the choice is, like if I'm if I'm trying to make like a really important choice, do I marry this person? Do I go to this particular school? Do I take this job? Do I leave? Do I move somewhere? That these choices affect literally everything that happens in our lives from this point onwards. And so those would be choices that you wouldn't want to just make in an impromptu way. You'd want to slow down and feel through the totality of all your values and and really does this make sense? And is this something I can support? And will this actually be good in, in, in a kind of you know, comprehensive sort of sense. So in the same sort of way that as a species, we need to think about actually slowing down to the right rate. Changes happening too fast, very dangerous. Um, a bomb is a change happening way too fast. But on the other hand, if you have things moving way too slowly, you end up with starvation or stagnation or uh, a different kind of pain, which is essentially cessation and death. So in effect, having the right rate of change is critically important. And so in a sense, we're, we as the, the human, in effect, is moderating the relationship between uh, slow, gradual changes happening everywhere at once in the form of evolution and find uh, five, sorry, very fast changes happening in the area of technology that are driving uh, what is currently being experienced in the world at large. Um, so in effect, we now need to come into the, the notion of what is right governance? What is what is the right balance between um, things moving in a sustainable way and things moving in an evolutionary way? Because both are needed. I'm going to stop with that and return the floor to you. Thank you. Well, uh, one, so I think that it's a few interesting things there. One, it seems like you're suggesting there's an inverse correlation between the uh, significance of the choice and the pace at which we have to move. And that that's not always the, um, the bigger the choice, the slower we have to move. It's the almost more related to the rate of change. So a big choice that has quick change, we have to move slow, a big choice or significant choice that is uh, itself moving slowly, like you're saying starvation, we have to we have to make quick decisions. And then another piece that you spoke to, you spoke to the the idea of the firm and the corporation, or the the that these are actually in effect technology. And so, yes, we have we have been subsumed. We have humanity has become in service to technology through uh, innovations like the corporation. 
uh, thought those were interesting points. So we're, we're just about to wrap up when really reiterating what you just shared, it would make much more sense to then rather than have uh, think of nature in service to humanity uh, through technology to have technology be in service to nature, to be in service of the well being, not just of the natural world, but our capacity to make choice. If we see how significant choice making is today, then it's vital that we uh, leverage these tools to increase our capacity to get better at it. And I would suggest that that not only means, you know, better governance tools and um, community building methodologies, but this is where uh, I think something like EGP, for those not familiar, ephemeral group process, it's a method that FORCE developed for getting to collective or community uh, agreement or decision making, choice making, without falling into the traditional town hall traps of the loudest voice gets the most attention, the most charismatic voice gets the most attention, and the the general polarization that we're seeing uh, in the in the world today. So I would love uh, maybe another time to get more deep into that, but. Um, Currently, mostly, are we use technology not to support nature and better choice making, but as you pointed out, to focus on institutional design. And if we want to move into a world where we have freedom of choice and the capacity to make good choices, we're going to have to reconcile these dynamics in a fundamental way. And those were the last lines uh, that Forrest shared when he gave the keynote. And because we had such a packed schedule, we didn't get to... Um, hear him expand or ask questions. So love to uh, force if there's anything, I, I feel like in a sense, you you really spoke to that last point already, but if there's anything you wanted to um, add on, uh, feel free. And then we'll, if you're okay with it, we'll open it up to questions. I'm actually good with the presentation. I think that there was a lot that that moved really well, and and um, obviously there's so many. But in, anything that's a keynote, the idea is to open up for future conversations. So, in effect, we've 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 created a lot of positions that people can bookmark and say, okay, let's expand that and have a conversation about that and really explore what does this mean and how do we put this into practice. Um, so, in, in that sense, I think I'm fine with what's been presented. Um, and I'm open to questions. Okay. Well, if anyone uh, has any questions, feel free to put your hand up. Uh, just going through the notes in the chat. Kilu, good to see you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. And. Uh, you know, so much there definitely opened a bunch of things up. What really struck with me is this notion of love enables choice. And I'm thinking of it as in terms of as energetic, in terms of as a way of being, in terms of as what is very well utilized in other primordial wisdom settings that we have moved away from and community and so on. But I'd love to hear more what I'm not thinking of, how I'm not seeing. And I'm, I, I give a little bit of a background. So I'm innovation funding funder by background and I'm right now thinking about sort of value exchange systems from the perspective that many of the build a better world folks build things and they say, well, just give me a check and I know what to do. And many investors say, well, just show me a thing I can fund, like it fits my criteria and it's well done. And they meet and there's an impasse. It's not happening. And if I take the money and resources out of it, what is happening is the entrepreneurs are building their thing anyway. And the, you know, all, everyone, entrepreneurs or not, that are doing the build a good world. And they are doing that from that love thing. Like that's the energy they come from. And I, I'm, there's something there about this love enables choice, as well as what you talked about, the sort of, the community, the change that we come from, the individuation, the technology in service of technology itself, even though the forms are different between you know, technology looking like X, supporting technology of let's say business and whatever else. Like 
love enables choice part if, if you could talk to that sure the uh so basically i'm hearing two broad questions which is one uh, what are some really deep ways to understand love is that which enables choice and the other is how does this concept show up in say venture capitalism or the startup of new uh, new initiatives to do things in the world and probably not just businesses per se in the sense of startups but also in the sense of new communities um, so so broadly that's what I'm hearing as the questions is that mostly correct yes and maybe it would be interesting to future cast or rather back cast from the future mm -hmm. where the venture capital startups and any of that is doing it right and well okay utilizing this well great um, so, so broadly speaking, just on the notion of love is that which enables choice as a as an idea. Um, well, first of all, it is um, it is essentially a way of defining the concept of love. It's kind of a litmus test, and it's one that can be applied uh, both individually and at the level of the relationship between, say, a government and a citizen, uh, or between one community and another, as I've mentioned, uh, in the sense of friendships. Um, in, in all sorts of different ways. So in other words, the idea here is that um, when we're thinking about not just what is the feeling or the experience of love, which might be described really well in poetry, but to actually describe what is the practice of love, like how do we actually do love and how do we recognize the right skillfulness that we need in those practices? So in a sense, it's a bit like uh, rather than going to school to learn a trade, which is, you know, something that I do in the world, um, that I'm in effect going to a kind of, of um, guilds process or some sort of live-in experience, uh, i.e. a family, which teaches us how to be skillful in relationships. So in a sense, the idea here is, is that uh, when we're looking at relational process, we're looking at, uh, in a lot of cases, not just needs fulfillment, but also discovery, like, who are we? What is what is this world we're in? What are the kinds of things that, that we can share with one another that aren't transactional, but are actually just, uh, in a sense, enjoyment of life, uh, celebration of the, of the beauty and the joy of life? So in this sense, if I'm enabling someone to fulfill their dreams, like if I have a partner and I, and I notice that they would really like to, to open an antique shop, I might say, well, let's just go to a bunch of antique shops and, and, and just look at how they how they do it, or, or maybe we go to a few uh, flea markets or something, we start acquiring stock or, or whatnot. The point is, is that there's a kind of engagement that's happening that is essentially moving a person from uh, some sort of just abstract idealization to a genuine felt embodiment so that they can, in a sense, discover how that helps them to become alive and what sort of things uh, they learn about themselves as part of the process. In other words, they become more them. And, and so in this sense, it's, a, it's, 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 it's not just, you know, something that happens, say, between partners, but specific, uh, specifically with how parents enable children. Like if we're saying, are we loving our children well? We're, you know, again, a baby would be uh, maybe unable to make any choices for itself other than, you know, whether to wave, wave its arms or go goo-goo or something like that. Um, but at some point, you know, 18 years later, we're hoping that they can make all the choices that they need to make in their lives in a wise way. So there's this gradual teaching people how to make good choices. And so in effect, we're trying to enable them to make good choices because, you know, after the parents die, the child is going to be an adult and they have to make wise choices on their own. So in effect, this notion of enabling choice or enabling our children to choose well and wisely is is fundamental to even what the very act of parenting is so so in this sense we we're starting to notion that the, the starting to notice that the that the notion of love is that which enables choice not just works as a way of characterizing friendship relationships or parent child relationships or uh, lover relationships but also the notion of of even the relationship between say a uh, government and a citizen you know, is 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 a government performing well? Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, normally we think of it, if we're going back to the classical roots, we're saying something like, it protects the land and the people. And if it fails to do that, it's just not a good government because it's not protecting the future. It's not enabling choices for the land or the people that live there um, in, in any real way. 
So in effect, we're saying, well, a really good government, like not just a basic government, but a good governance is going to be one that um, helps the people, helps the land and the people to thrive. And so in this sense, it is enabling choice, both in the present and in the future. Because if it thrives today, but dies tomorrow, that's just not very good choice making. So in this sort of sense, when we're looking at the relationship between, say, an investor and a um, a startup person, an entrepreneur of some sort or another. Um, one thing that we notice about this, first of all, is, is that both of these are um, kind of held within a larger context of transactionalism. And I haven't mentioned transaction yet, so I have to kind of characterize in a, in a, in a basic sense what's actually going on when we say uh, this for that, quid pro quo, for example. Um, this isn't necessarily the case in an intimate relationship or in a uh, parent-child relationship that the parent is investing in the child because the parent is expecting some return on investment. Um, so, so in this case, we, we do need to recognize that transactional relationships are, are, are making a lot more assumptions, a lot more specific assumptions than are genuinely implied in the, the notion of uh, love as that which enables choice. The, the, the specific assumption is, is that choice can be moved from an embodied level to an abstracted level, i.e. that um, I can save up choices. Now, it's actually endemic to the nature of choice itself that we can only really make them in the present. I mean, I can review choices I've made in the past and I think about choices I made in the future, but in an embodied level, choices are very much in the present. But when we think about some instrument, like a monetary instrument, like you know, printed money or coins or whatnot, um, regardless of whether you know we're talking about it in some sort of cryptocurrency sense or, or anything else like that, the idea is, is that we are effectively storing up potentials to make future choices. Like if I if I had like a million dollars and it's it's sitting in a bank, that could, for example, represent the potential to build a building that could become you know a new uh, um, auto repair shop or bowling alley or something, right? The idea is, is that I could use the monetary instrument as long as I believe that you believe that they believe that those monetary instruments represent choices, represent future energy or future embodiments of pattern. That in effect, I can coordinate a large number of people's choices to in effect implement infrastructure that itself would facilitate future choices, i.e. I could operate the bowling alley. So in effect, there's a, there's a sense here in which um, the, the idea of abstract virtualized choice could be um, taken out of context, de-embodied, um, abstracted, basically, and accumulated, and that in effect, this represents future choices, which then I can then trade and, and, and do the kinds of things that a venture capitalist would do, which would be to say, I'll give you some amount of choice potential now if you will give me increased choice potential in the future, i.e. Uh, capital over capital return on investment. And the thing is, is that um, when we're looking at, say, the Wall Street type process, where you have uh, people doing trades in this sense of capital over capital investment, um, there is a sense in which this notion of abstraction, that the idea that the choices are uh, completely ungrounded with respect to the embodiment. So in effect, uh, an investor um, is compelling on the part of the entrepreneurs that the entrepreneurs have to receive or have to organize themselves or structure themselves so that they can receive uh, monetary instruments to enable them to do the things that they want to do. And so if I have, say, an investor and there's three entrepreneurs lined up, uh, one of which is doing a business model that's, that's uh, very helpful for the environment, but their return on investment is only going to be, uh, say, 80% of what investor, I'm sorry, entrepreneur B is going to do, who's going to do a similar business model, but is a little less coherent with the environment, um, which is itself a little less than C, for example. C is going to be completely destructive to the environment, but their business is going to give uh, better capital over capital returns. So in effect, there's now a decoupling between the idea of investing capital in order to receive capital for the sake of increased accumulation for a future that is effectively private versus um, actually enabling choices in the global sense of what's happening in the marketplace, of which businesses develop, what products get made, 
what relationships those have to communities. It's now in effect decoupled from uh, the notion of what is actually good for the well-being of the world at an embodied level. And so in this sense, when we're thinking about values, we really need to be very, very conscious of the difference between embodied values versus abstract values or um, em embodied choices versus abstract choices. And so in effect, what we're looking at in the world today is essentially uh, due to a confusion about this, um, wide scale um, decoherency, disorganization or increasing disorganization uh, structurally at a uh, ecosystem level in favor of uh, increased pattern coherency in say uh, databases at banks. So you know your account information is stored as a series of numbers in some record somewhere or another um, in, a, in a database. And for a brief period of time, we have this uh, slight increase in the data coherency at the cost of uh, tremendous decreases in the coherency of the ecosystem. So in this sense, the, the, the notion here is, is that if we're really looking at um, what is effective venture capitalism, there's a point at which we actually need to say, at what point do we stop just accumulating capital over capital and actually move into a sense of reintegrating coherency in the embodied world, reintegrating coherency in the environment? And so this moves it from a uh, project orientation to a kind of uh, patronage where we're actually looking not so much for, hey, we have a prior notion of what wisdom um, or health or holism or um, you know, ecological soundness and completeness looks like, but we know that the processes that we're using facilitate an increase in health. So in a sense, rather than telling someone, hey, I have these metrics that I want to ensure uh, go up as a result of, of your thing, if I try to measure health in a sort of um, number-based way, then as, as I'm sure you know, Goodhart's principle is going to come to apply. People are going to optimize for the numbers. So this is actually going to increase health in the world. It's going to increase the appearance of health in the world, more virtualization. So in this sense, if we're looking to um, actually be effective, we need to step back from the notion of, of transactional process and actually look at it from the point of view of enablement process with the notion of that the process itself is health generating. So this is moving us um, you know, from, from a sort of business institution orientation to a community and health of community. And can resources given to that community be held by that community? Can they stay in the process of integrity that they can continue to make healthy choices and therefore facilitate not just well-being and thriving in themselves, but also in the lands that they're a part of. So this goes back to good governance. So in effect, if we're thinking about venture capitalism as being just within the realm of, say, um, evolutionary process and not within the realm of sustainability process or governance process, then in effect, we're looking at an incomplete process, right? Because the functions of good governance and the functions of sustainability are of a different order and character than the kind of functions that would be associated with, um, you know, what we would think of as good, wise business investing. So in that sense, um, the idea of love is that which enables choice is effectively kind of a way of litmus testing. Have we moved beyond just the confines of transactional process to something which is genuinely health increasing as a process fundamentally? And so usually we're looking at um, not investment and not even just grants, but actually uh, patronage relationships, where if you have someone that is deeply skilled, or even better, a community that is itself inherently deeply skilled at creating the sort of thriving in lands and, 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 and communities, then for sure we would want to, if they were also good steward of, of translating in, uh, virtual resources into embodied resources, we would for sure want to do patronage for that, rather than to have a prior notion as held from an individual perspective as to what does health actually look like, what does wisdom actually look like. We might apply a lot of litmus tests to ensure that we're making good choices about that, but ultimately we need to see um, choice making to the to the community itself for it to discern for its own nature what is actually wisdom in the world. Um, these are 
this is this is kind of a really rough outline of 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 an entire constellation of concepts but it gives you at least a perspective as to how functionally love is that which translates love is that which enables choice translates into uh, macroeconomic thinking and how that might show up at mesoeconomic levels.